Hello everyone, and welcome to this What's Online talk, Aliens and Strangers, Migration to England in the Early Modern Period. The term aliens and strangers referred to continental migrants, those who came to England from mainland Europe. Between 1550 and 1750, a large number of these aliens and strangers settled in England for two main reasons. Firstly, there were those coming to England for economic reasons, for work. The English economy in the 16th century was largely reliant on the cloth industry, and foreign knowledge and skills were required to increase and improve in English manufacturing, industry and trade. Secondly, there were those coming to England in pursuit of refuge from religious or political persecution. The Reformation of the 16th century created sharp divides between the traditional Catholic faith and the emerging arms of the Protestant Church. England, which had been a non-Catholic power since Henry VIII divorced himself from Roman authority in the 1530s, therefore became a safe haven for Protestants in exile for most of this period, barring the odd Catholic monarch and civil war. These two causes were not mutually exclusive, and in fact often a combination of the two explains why aliens and strangers chose to uproot themselves and their families and move to England at this time. The two key religious and political causes of migration to England in the early modern period were the persecution of non-Catholics as part of the Dutch revolt in the 16th century and the persecution of Huguenot Protestants in France, which continued throughout the early modern period, hitting its peak in the 1680s. The Dutch revolt, begun in the 1560s, was a religious and political clash between the native Dutch and their Spanish rulers. At its end, the Low Countries were divided much as you can see on the map pictured with the Spanish-controlled Netherlands to the south and the Republic of the Seven United Provinces, which would become the Netherlands that we know today, to the north. The first wave of migrants coming out of the southern Netherlands occurred shortly after 1566. In that year, a group of Calvinists stormed churches across the country in what became known as the Iconoclasm or Bildenstorm. In response, Philip of Spain sent Fernando Alvarez, the third Duke of Alba, to Brussels to suppress the rebellion, who set up the so-called Council of Troubles to punish the perpetrators. As news of the Duke's arrival spread, Protestant refugees fled the Low Countries en masse, and it's estimated that between 60 and 100,000 people fled the Southern Netherlands in the spring and summer of 1567. Those that stayed were treated harshly and over a thousand people were executed in the following months, with the Duke's court receiving the nickname the Council of Blood in the Netherlands. As Spanish fortunes in the Netherlands subsided, the Dutch states were able to gain some semblance of independence, finally renouncing Spanish rule in 1581. This, however, prompted a Spanish response. And in the early 1580s, several parts of the southern Netherlands, including Antwerp, fell to the Spanish. This reconquest, coupled with the assassination of William of Orange, the leader of the Dutch Revolt in 1584, prompted another wave of immigration out of the Southern Netherlands, with between 100,000 and 150,000 people moving to the Dutch Republic in the North, Germany and England. Where then can we find evidence of these refugees in the records? One of the best examples is that of Guillaume or William Copin. Copin originally formed part of the mercantile elite in Valenciennes in present-day northern France, which in 1562 was where the first act of resistance against the Spanish persecution of Protestants occurred. Copin was a Protestant Walloon, a French-speaking people from the southern Netherlands, part of present-day Belgium. In March 1567, Valenciennes surrendered to the pro-Spanish government and Copin made his escape to England, ignoring his summons to appear before the Council of Troubles. Copin appears among the French Protestant exile community in Southampton in the later 1560s and moved to London around 1570. One of the things that the English government did at this time was compile surveys, otherwise known as returns of aliens, and Copin appears in both of the London returns for 1571. The entry pictured is for November that year, which described Guillaume Copin, a Walloon and silk weaver, with his wife and five children, who have resided in England for four years and came over for religion's sake. 
i.e. to escape religious persecution. Once you have the name, you can do more traditional searches in Discovery, our catalogue. Copan's will, pictured, sheds light on some interesting migrant perspectives. First, the will was originally written in French and translated for the probate register. Second, in his will, he mentions a hope that the Low Countries will soon be free and that he should be able to receive the profits and sales of his goods left in Valenciennes. They'd been forfeited when he failed to appear before the Council of Troubles. The second major religious conflict that affected migration to England in the early modern period was the persecution of the Huguenots in France, which lasted through the French Wars of Religion in the 16th century until the Edict of Versailles in 1787, which finally granted non-Catholics in France the right to openly practice their religions. The persecution of the Huguenots began in earnest in 1562, after the French regent, Catherine de' Medici, granted the Edict of Janvier, also known as the Edict of Saint-Germain, giving Protestants the right to practice their religion without interference. This provoked a violent response from Catholics, who saw Calvinism as undermining traditional religion. The portrait on the slide depicts the massacre of Huguenots at Tours by French troops, part of the First War of 1562-1563. And for the remainder of the 16th century, we see a lot of back and forth of refugees, who sometimes opted to return to their homeland when hostilities subsided, only to leave again after the next period of violence. Thus, after the initial wave of emigration from France in 1562, refugees returned after the pacification of Amboise in 1563 reinstated some Protestant freedoms. Sporadic conflicts in the 1560s kept tensions between Catholics and Huguenots fraught, and this came to a head in 1572 with the St. Bartholomew's Day Massacre, resulting in the deaths of around 2,000 Huguenots in Paris and thousands more in the provinces. After which, unsurprisingly, there was another wave of Protestant emigration from France. The top picture dates from 1573 and describes how a man hanged in Paris was suspected of being a Huguenot, so was cut down by the populace and drawn through the streets. However, it wasn't until the late 17th century that we see proper mass migration of Huguenots from France. Though non-Catholics were ostensibly allowed to practice their own religion in France after 1598, there was still pressure to convert to Catholicism. The Dragonade in 1681, essentially granting French dragoons permission to harass Protestant families, were instituted by the French King Louis XIV to intimidate Huguenot families into converting to Catholicism or leaving France. This served as a precursor to Louis's revocation of the Edicts of Nantes, which granted Protestants freedom of religion in 1685, resulting in thousands of Huguenots leaving France for England, the Netherlands and the New World. The English authorities welcomed these Huguenot refugees who were fleeing their enemy, the Catholic King Louis XIV. The final picture on this slide shows William III's declaration welcoming French Protestants to England from 1689. This was just a single instance in a long line of royal charters and declarations to welcome religious refugees to England. In 1550, Edward VI had granted a charter allowing religious refugees in London to set up their own churches. Though the reign of Mary witnessed the persecution of non-Catholics in England, the long reign of Elizabeth and her more Protestant friendly policies once again made England an attractive prospect for those fleeing Catholic persecution on the continent. Though England wasn't the most welcoming place during the Civil War period, during the interregnum, Oliver Cromwell did invite a small number of Jews to come to England, who had been expelled from the realm by Edward I in 1290, over three centuries earlier. English monarchs had another reason for wanting to encourage migration to England in the early modern period, rather than just one-upping their religious and political rivals on the continent. Throughout the medieval and early modern periods, aliens and strangers were invited by the English government to reinvigorate English trades and boost the economy. In the 14th century, Flemish and Dutch artisans, on an invitation from Edward III, came to England to help develop the English cloth industry. 
In the 16th century, it was aliens that helped introduce new industries such as draperies, fine linen, copper and brass, glass making, paper and cordage. In the 17th century, England benefited from the influx of Huguenots, who gave stimulus to manufacturers such as silk, linen, hats, soap and white paper. The Huguenots too had a positive impact on the burgeoning capitalist industries, and the first governor of the Bank of England, Sir John Hublon, was the grandson of a Huguenot refugee. In the early modern period, aliens and strangers helped to diversify the number of trades practiced in England. And at the end of the 17th century, England had over four times as many named trades as it had had in the medieval period, from 180 to at least 720. Why though, did England need to accept this influx of skilled labor? The short answer is that English, the English lacked the native skills required for many of these industries. In 1565, it's estimated that around 80% of England's exports was cloth, which accrued an income of around 550,000 pounds. Good for the cloth industry, but not enough to sustain a balanced trade economy. And it meant that England's import costs were high and reliant on two Catholic powers, France and Spain, for these imports. There was therefore a real fear of embargoes. And so the English government had to look for ways to reduce this reliance on foreign trade. There was an awareness too among contemporary Englishmen that their knowledge of certain skills was lacking. In 1608, Londoners remarked that in Elizabeth's reign, Englishmen were not so skillful in trades to make all kinds of wares, but now the people had mightily increased both in number and were skillful of all kind and manner of trades. In 1574, Jacques Taffin, the treasurer of Flushing in Rebel Zealand in the Netherlands, wrote in a letter to the Queen, you receive many strangers into the realm, so you find them good, honest and virtuous people, and the realm by them receives many commodities, as cunning in many sciences, wherein before you were altogether ignorant. So what did the crown get out of this influx of aliens and strangers? Firstly, and most obviously, the crown received more money from aliens than they did native born English. Depending on where you were born, you had different rights and freedoms available to you in England. Writing in the early 17th century, Sir Francis Bacon identified four degrees of person when it came to naturalization. The first type, which received the fewest rights and liberties in England, were alien enemies. The crown possessed absolute rights over this type of person, including the power to expel from the realm. Thus in 1554, during England's brief resurgence of Catholicism under Mary I, the Queen was able to expel all seditious and non-denizen aliens from the realm. The second type, alien friends, had many of the rights of subjects and were protected by the law, owed temporary allegiance to the crown and were obliged to take the oath required of subjects. Following the evil May Day riots of 1517, Henry VIII's Chief Justice, Sir John Phoenix, was able to argue that those rioters that had attacked such alien friends in London were guilty of treason. Aliens were prohibited from leasing property, opening or keeping a shop, and purchasing property. Plus, they paid double the rate of taxation. To gain some of these rights, aliens had to apply for denization via letter patent. This gave them permanent residency and superior economic rights. In particular, they could purchase land. They could not, however, inherit real property. And it's in this denization process that we're able to find more records of aliens and strangers within the collections at the National Archives. Denization could only be granted via a letter patent. We have evidence of the applications for such letters in the state papers and later the Home Office collections and a search of the patent rolls, most of which have been calendared, provide evidence of when these letters of denization were granted. In the 18th century, it becomes easier to find evidence of denization as dedicated record series begin to be created. C97 contains original letters patent of denization between 1752 and 1830, and two of our earliest Home Office series, H01 and H04, provide papers and correspondence relating to the denization of aliens. Pictured is an application from 1648, 
of one David de Costa, who had been living and working in England for many years, taking the king's oaths and paying alien customs. English monarchs sometimes granted denization en masse to religious refugees. Following the Dragonades in 1681, Charles II granted denization to all Huguenots fleeing the French King Louis XIV. And in 1709, the British government passed the Foreign Protestants Naturalization Act, which invited European Protestants to come and settle in Britain as naturalized citizens. But not all migrants could afford such letters. In 1582, Letter denization cost two pounds, 12 shillings and four pence to purchase, beyond the means of many aliens. Approximately three quarters of all aliens in England at that time did not meet the tax threshold for holding goods of over three pounds or holding land over the value of one pound. So having to pay over two pounds for denization was not within their means. Records of denization are just one type of record relating to aliens and strangers, which can be found through consulting the patent rolls and their calendars. Another way the English Crown received money from migrants in the early modern period was through the sale of patents for new industries. I mentioned earlier that the English government was keen to promote new types of trade and industry in England. In the medieval period, this was usually done through letters of protection or financial grants and subsidies. But in the 16th century, and particularly in Elizabeth's reign, the government began to favour instead the patent system. These were letters patent, like those of denization, granting the recipient certain rights relating to their trade, such as exclusive rights to ply this trade for a certain number of years, or a discount on customs in exchange for a share of the profits. In 1552, there was a patent granted for glass making. In 1554, there was one to search for and work metals, and so on. Evidence of these records, plus the aliens and strangers that they were granted to, can also be found through searching the patent rolls, often for keywords such as salt or mining in the calendars. But my favourite series relating to these patents is E355, which contains a handful of these original letters for trades ranging from the production of white salt to exclusive mining rights. A couple of these patents were granted to Francis Bertie, one of which is pictured. We know a little bit more about his attempts to establish the new English trade in white salt through other letters he wrote to the government, such as one in 1566, where Bertie asked that his patent not be voided, even though he'd been unable to start making salt in England because the ship carrying the materials required for production was delayed. The English guilds were also heavily involved in the regulation of these new trades and any patent to alien merchants would only be given after consultation with native artisans had completed to make sure that they were not encroaching on existing trades and craft and that they could not be completed by native artisans instead. Patents also contained conditions regarding price and quality and if these were not met they could be revoked. A patent to Roger Huxtonberry and Bartholomew Verberich in 1565 stipulated that any of the Spanish leather they made be subject to quality checks by the worshipful company of leather sellers. The oddest example of these patents which I found was this one in E355253. Elizabeth had been contacted by one Benedict Spinola of Genoa, now living in London, who said he'd discovered a new invention by Berthold Holzschuer of Nuremberg, Germany, claimed by Holzschuer to augment and increase the revenue of the English crown yearly to a far greater extent than at present. For one tenth of all these profits, Spinola promised to get Holtschuer to reveal his secrets to the Queen. This request was granted, even though it reads a little like a 16th century internet scam, because it costs the Queen nothing to grant this request. And frustratingly, we don't actually know what the invention was that they're talking about. A 1559 attempt to bring over Italian silk workers to England gives us a little more information about the sort of privileges granted to aliens. This list and the preceding folios in the state paper volume describe how two merchants called Springham and Locke planned to bring workers and they, put, they listed the costs and liberties involved. They were to be granted a church where the Italian workers could worship freely in their own tongue they were to be given a house for 10 years, big enough for four families, with room for their weaving materials. 
they were to be waived customs for 10 years on all silk they produced, and for eight years they would hold a, monop a monopoly on such a trade. Elizabeth and her council were not the first to receive proposals from aliens to introduce new trades. This letter from 1537 was by the Italian Antony Giordotti to Thomas Cromwell. He'd recently been to Messina, where he had seen the positive effects that the introduction of Italian silk weavers had had there, and proposed to Cromwell that he would bring over similar master silk weavers to revive the declining fortunes of Southampton. In return, Giordotti requested a 15-year monopoly on silk weaving. However, this venture failed, in part because Giordotti spent some of his royal advance given to him for the purchase of raw silk from Antwerp on Gascon wines instead. The English crown and government were therefore receptive to immigrants in the early modern period for the positive impacts they had on trade and industry in England and the money they brought in through taxation and the purchase of patents. However, there were concerns about foreigners. There was always a worry that alien enemies could infiltrate England claiming religious asylum. After 1570, when Elizabeth I was excommunicated, there was a real fear of Catholic insurgents removing her from the throne. Additionally, though England by and large happily received aliens and strangers fleeing religious persecution, they were a lot more sceptical of those immigrants coming over for work. This slide shows some of these complaints. The first, a 17th century act made in response to complaints by the felt makers that their trade was being impaired by aliens and strangers. And the second, made by the English citizens of London, who were aggrieved at two sorts of strangers settling in the city, merchants and handicraftsmen. These complaints came out of very real concerns for English tradesmen, though there were measures in place to ensure that England was not overrun with foreign trades if they were detrimental to native industry. As I mentioned earlier, English guilds did have a say in which patents could be granted to aliens and strangers when those grants related to their trades. They also kept their own list of alien tradesmen, and it's likely that guild pressure was the cause of the number of trades practiced by aliens falling from 190 to 136 between the years 1571 and 1593. In part as a response to the concerns over aliens and strangers residents in England, the government ordered surveys or returns of aliens to be made. The first national survey of foreigners in England was created in November 1571, though the state papers from that year show that it was a present concern some months before. A month earlier, in October, William Hurl had requested he be made surveyor of foreigners to make a record of those aliens and strangers entering the realm. The returns of aliens, many of which survive in manuscript form, provide us with some of the richest documentary evidence of aliens and strangers in early modern England. For London, there are six major extant lists surviving between 1568 and 1593. The 1568 list, pictured on the right of this slide, has been digitised and is available to view for free on the British Library website. The other lists are available on state papers online. These returns can contain names, occupations, city of origins or previous abode, length and place of residence in London, church membership, number of children and number of servants. In 1571, when concerns around the reason for aliens living in England were highest, the returns contain information about why these foreigners emigrated to England. Hence William Copan's entry reading by reason of religion. In 1593, it seems there was a concern around the number of English servants employed by these aliens, and so the list for that year includes this figure. However, the returns aren't completely reliable because you have to factor in non-English speakers providing information to people that did not understand their language, or those bending the truth with regard to their occupation so as not to encroach upon English trades. These returns were made by the mayor and aldermen of London and of the towns and cities in which aliens and strangers resided in response to government orders. The pictured slide shows the return for London and stating as much in the preamble. A typical entry reads as such, Simon Chevalier, born in Rouen in Normandy, Denizen, by occupation a coppersmith, came into this realm about 33 years past to work and he's of the French church. 
This tells us an awful lot about the individual. He was a denizen, so had purchased a patent of denization. Therefore, in theory, you could check the patent rolls for confirmation. He'd been in England since the 1540s, and he was a coppersmith. It also notes that he was of the French church, which brings me briefly onto stranger churches. These were churches set up in England so that aliens and strangers could worship in their own way, in their own language. They were incredibly important to stranger communities in England, providing spiritual needs and poor relief, acting as disciplinary bodies, i.e. keeping their congregation in line with government sanctions, and conversely acting as pressure groups when they felt that their flock were being taken advantage of, and also they provided social centres for the immigrant community. And it wasn't only London that provided such returns. This 1571 certificate names all the strangers and aliens living in Great Yarmouth. Though the ink is a little faded, the certificate gives us a little detail about the 16th century immigrant community in Great Yarmouth. Household 1 describes John Williamson as living with Jane, his wife, two unnamed children and no servants. John is a cooper, a maker of casks or barrels, has lived in Great Yarmouth for two years and is from Zealand in the Northern Netherlands, from which New Zealand takes its name. And it wasn't just central government initiatives that attempted to bring foreign masters into England. This book of orders for Dutch and well-owned strangers in Norwich, kept at the Norfolk Record Office, describes how the mayor and corporation of Norwich formally invited named aliens, 24 Dutch and six Walloon, to help revitalize its cloth industry in the 1560s. Each could bring up to 10 people with him. Many local record offices contain such books, listing aliens and strangers, often of a specific trade or religion, for the government initiatives to promote the plying of new trades were not limited solely to London. In the early Elizabethan period, the government advertised for skilled aliens and strangers to populate local towns such as Sandwich, Norwich, Colchester, Southampton, Maidstone and Canterbury. Also, aware that London was often the initial place in England that aliens and strangers headed for, the government, sometimes under pressure from the London Mayor, Aldermen and Guilds, created limits on the number of alien tradesmen that could operate in the capital, encouraging aliens to disperse to other towns and cities. To briefly conclude then, England in the early modern period received a huge influx of aliens and strangers from the continent, many of whom settled in England and made it their home. Some came because they had no other choice, forced from the land of their birth because of their religion. Others came because they possessed skills that helped boost the English trade and economy through foreign expertise. This second group of migrants were encouraged to come to England through government incentives and invitations. However, the most successful trade enterprises in early modern England occurred when both of these factors were in play during periods of prolonged warfare and conflict on the continent. It was the economic migrant that the English were most mistrustful of, and a number of complaints and concerns survive in our records relating to this grievance. On the whole though, those migrants that stayed in England made a positive contribution to the English economy and society. And I'll leave you with a quote from the early modern historian John Stripe, who wrote of the Elizabeth Elizabethan influx of alien strangers, that it was in the Englishman's nature to be somewhat inhospitable to strangers, jealous of their industry and suspecting of them to get their trade away from them. However, the wiser and better sort of Englishmen were rather for cherishing these strangers, as well perceiving what advantages they brought to the nation, both for their callings and examples of thrift and diligence, as also by rendering the Queen's enemy weaker by the dispeopling of his countries and abating of his trade and traffic. Thank you.